Welcome everybody to this uh, uh, Seals Cafe. Uh, as you know, that's a two voice X ray dialogue uh, among two uh, selected uh, researchers. Um, typically, we selected two voices in this way uh, somebody, uh, someone from a field, uh, even uh, without any knowledge of X ray or synchrotron or even x fell now of, of course for Matteo is not this the, the case but uh, is not a technical person let's say and um, the other voice on the contrary is somebody deeply involved uh, in with synchrotron or x fell like it is today and so we will start with the, um, the speech uh, of uh, Matteo Busato who graduated in chemistry at the University of Venice and took his PhD in environmental and energy engineering science at the University of Udine. And currently, uh, Matteo is working as postdoc, uh, postdoc at the University La Sapienza in Rome in the group held by Professor Paola D'Angelo. So I will leave the floor now to Matteo and then um, we will uh, return to this. Uh, a slide and I will introduce the other speaker. So please, Matteo. Okay. Is the presentation full screen now? Yes, it is. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Cinzia, and good afternoon to everyone, and uh, thank you for the kind invitation to this interesting talk. So, today, uh, basically, I would like to show you uh, some of our works where we uh, basically struggle in finding a, a rationale to uh, the body of data that uh, we collected with uh, a combined approach between different methods, both uh, theoretical and uh, experimental ones, in trying to unveil the structural arrangement of uh, some hypothetical solvents in particular conditions, for example, when put in contact with other co-solvents, since uh, serious modifications are expected in that case. But first, uh, let me spend just a few words about uh, DES in general since I think that even if they are currently very studied, there is still chance that someone in the audience will never work with them. Uh, a strict definition of uh, these systems has been for a long time a source of uh, debate in the scientific community. However, nowadays scientists seem to agree in defining DES as mixtures okay, of uh, two or even more compounds showing a melting point the pressure that is lower, that is deeper than the ideally predicted one, at least for one composition, so for one molar ratio between the, the components. Even there is, if uh, there is still a, a debate about the extent of the, the required melting point, the pressure to produce a true uh, deep eutectic solvent. Uh, as a consequence of uh, this uh, unusual thermal behavior, a uh, liquid phase can often be obtained even from solid starting materials. Here, for example, I'm showing the case of Relin, which is the first ever presented DES. It is made by calling chloride and urea at this precise molar uh, ratio. And the origin of this unusual uh, macroscopic thermal behavior uh, rely probably on the strong and intricate network of interactions among uh, the two components, uh, often relying on hydrogen bonding, so that they can be divided into hydrogen bond donors and uh, acceptors, and here I'm reporting just a few of them as an example. Among the most common acceptors, we, they are mostly based around quaternary ammonium salts, like choline chloride, but metal salts can be employed too. Among the, the common donors, we find mostly alcohols, carboxylic acids. Nevertheless, the main feature of uh, almost all these compounds is that of being uh, highly biocompatible, non-toxic, and often also cheap. Another source of debate in the scientific community is the uh, DS classification. Here I'm reporting the most accepted one, based on five uh, categories. 
please note that uh, uh, the first four categories deal with uh, uh, salt containing uh, uh, DES, so ionic, co ionic components, and uh, differently, the more recently proposed type 5 ones are made by um, neutral molecular components only. And also, uh, three out of four, out of five, sorry, of the uh, currently proposed categories have a metal salt as one of the two components. These are named the metal-based diprotective solvents, and I will show you something about them in the last part of this talk. Okay, and basically here I'm showing you the reasons why these uh, uh, media are currently ruling the research topic about uh, new sustainable and alternative solvents. This is happening for uh, owing to some unique properties they often show and for what have been proposed and studied for a plethora of applications that I'm listing here, even if uh, this is, of course, uh, a not conclusive list. And I won't go through these properties, but uh, let me um, say that these macroscopic chemical physical properties can be seen, can be interpreted as deriving from the microscopic structural arrangement and interactions at atomic level. And our work is basically to find the, the hidden link between these two categories. This also implies that the specific DES or a specific purpose or experimental condition can be obtained by tailoring the single components. This means that um, if I change the components or their molar ratio, or if I introduce a new functional group or even act on chirality, the macroscopic properties of these uh, solvents are expected to dramatically change. And another design strategy is the addition of a co-solvent to a DDS. This is also a less resource demanding way since it does not require the synthesis of a new compound. However, uh, the co-solvent addition to, the, uh, to a DES is not only a design strategy, but uh, a co-solvent can be uh, present also for unwanted reasons. For example, in hygroscopic DES, if not properly treated, if not properly dried, a high amount of water can be present inside them. And uh, everything can also depend on the experimental conditions of an application. For example, in a liquid-liquid biphasic extraction, we have a, a hydrophobic DES that is put in contact with an aqueous phase to form a biphasic system. And a hydrophobic does not mean that uh, water is not uh, soluble inside the DES. On the contrary, it can be present up to the saturation limit in the DES phase. And uh, a lot of fun facts can happen to the structure of the pristine DES upon co-solvent introduction. The interaction can be either constructive or destructive, meaning that uh, the pristine nanostructure of the DES can be destroyed upon uh, uh, co-solvent addition or the formation of new nanostructures can be promoted. There is also a sort of a threshold for what the DES basically choose to be a DES and we obtain a, a solution of the DES components in the co-solvent. So these transitions deserve to be studied and we started to do that from this uh, DES formed by choline chloride and sesamol in 1 to 3 molar ratio. Since our collaborators who are uh, analytical chemists came to us with this eutectic telling that it nicely works for the separation of some uh, target compounds with the dispersive liquid-liquid uh, microextraction technique, where the adjective dispersive means that uh, a certain amount of a dispersing agent is present inside the DES that is a co-solvent, and in this case it's water. So this eutectic works better when a certain amount of water is present inside it. That uh, our curiosity became was the effect of water on its structural arrangement. But prior to that, we had to define the structure of uh, the pristine choline chloride sesamol DES before the addition of any co-solvent. So here I'm showing you the small and wide angle X-ray scattering spectra. 
collected on the on this DES compared to that collected on the prototypical DES railing. And we observe that the main wax peak, of course, at smaller angular values for calling chloride sesamol, suggesting that interatomic correlations at longer distances are found in this case with respect to relin. And uh, the reasons for that were provided by molecular dynamic simulations performed on the, the pristine eutectic. Here I'm showing a, a snapshot uh, highlighting the local coordination around the, the chloride anion. Uh, telling us that uh, uh, the eutectic structure is made by discrete chloride anion clusters where the chloride anion is able to coordinate almost the entire amount of available sesamol and choline molecules uh, in a solution, while the interaction between these two components do not occur. So uh, the final uh, structure sees uh, uh, the, this recurring uh, uh, chloride anions uh, at uh, precise distances forming areas of higher electron density interspersed by the carbon bodies formed by the sesamol and choline molecules forming areas of lower electron density. Uh, this recurring pattern is responsible for the, uh, the wax profile previously shown. Now it's time to see what happens when we add the water to this TES. Um, so we collected the swag spectra on mixtures of this TES with water at very smaller ratios. And as a result, we observe an increase in the scattered intensity, particularly in this region for low water contents up to a molar ratio of six, while there is a marked increase in the lowest angle region for higher water concentrations. Uh, of course, this spectral evolution is indicative of the increasing uh, formation of electron density in homogeneities. And from the SWAX profiles, we could also have uh, an estimation of the size of such inhomogeneities. And as a result, uh, small inhomogeneities of, let's say, about seven angstroms are formed for lower water contents, while they are enlarged up to 70 angstrom structures for higher water uh, concentrations. So to understand the composition of such inhomogeneities, we also collected the infrared spectra on the same uh, samples, and we focused on the OH uh, stretching region of uh, water, and we obtained uh, three water populations. At higher weight numbers, we have a, a weakly hydrogen bonded water with, I mean, uh, two or less hydrogen bonds per water molecule. We have an intermediate water and then at the um, lower weight numbers, a uh, networking water with a number of hydrogen bonds similar to pure bulk water. And if we report the intensity of each of these contributions separated and in function of water molar ratio, we observe that they behave similarly for low water contents. They increase linearly, while after this threshold there is a sort of differentiation. Weekly and intermediate water decreases slope, while network water increases. Now, to understand if uh, the phenomena we are observing uh, by infrared and swag spectroscopies are somewhat correlated, if we are observing the same thing, we also built two-dimensional correlation plots between the series of spectra collected by these two techniques and divided them into two plots, one for the lower and one for the higher water concentrations, where the areas of negative correlation are marked in blue, while of positive correlation are marked in red. And for the lower water contents, we observe an area of positive correlation between the small inhomogeneities observed by SWACs that correspond to the initial increase in the weak and intermediate hydrogen bonded water observed by infrared spectroscopy. On the other hand, for the higher water contents, we observe a positive correlation among the bigger inhomogeneities observed by SWACs with uh, the uh, networking water observed by infrared spectroscopy. So the final clues about what is happening in solution upon water addition were provided uh, by MD simulations. Here I am showing part of the trajectories for uh, the systems with the lower water contents where uh, water molecules are uh, highlighted in red. And we observe the formation of small water clusters 
that are responsible for the initial increase in the weak and intermediate hydrogen bonded water. And these are also the small inhomogeneities of surface wax. On the other hand, for the higher water concentrations, uh, in particular for this smaller ratio of 16, there is a proper segregation between a sesamo rich and a water rich uh, uh, region up to the formation of this uh, uh, nanopore of uh, water that is responsible for the final increase in the networking water and for the 70 angstrom inhomogeneities observed by SWAX. Also note that almost the entire amount of, choline chlor of the choline chloride component is confined inside this water pore. So that uh, the uh, structural arrangement of the pristine DES is basically disrupted upon the formation of the, this new uh, nanostructure. So uh, there is a proper pseudophase uh, segregation between a hydrophobic uh, uh, region, mainly constituting in sesamo, given also its poor water solubility, and the hydrophilic region that is basically a highly concentrated polychloride chloride solution in water. Even if I can assure you that uh, macroscopically this sample is uh, homogeneous with uh, no uh, phase separation observed by, by the naked eye. And this can also be an explanation for the versatile extraction uh, properties of this uh, eutectic since uh, a lipophilic uh, solute will probably uh, go inside the sesamo rich phase while a hydrophilic uh, analyte will migrate towards the water rich uh, region. And uh, uh, in light of trying to uh, find a point of contact with uh, uh, the area of uh, of um, expertise of Ruslan. Um, here I'm trying to give you a dynamic picture of the formation of uh, this pseudo phase separation. This is the equilibration phase taken by molecular dynamics uh, starting from a totally homogeneous situation and this should uh, show that uh, uh, the formation of uh, this uh, uh, segregation occurs in the nanoseconds time scale. A possible disclaimer is that uh, uh, classical non-polarizable uh, uh, molecular dynamics, like in this case, usually give a bad uh, estimation of uh, the dynamic properties, but this is the only dynamic situation I could uh, get, since the measurements have been performed on uh, uh, equilibrated samples in, uh, in batch mode. And uh, it will be maybe also interesting to uh, study the diffusion of a target analyte from the lipophilic to the hydrophilic uh, pseudo phase, maybe with a with pulsed uh, X rays with a high uh, temporal resolution. This could also give access to the extraction mechanism. Just uh, just a proposal. Now let's see what happens when we add methanol instead of water to this uh, eutectic. We choose to study methanol. As uh, for us, this is the, the organic solvent that most shares its properties with the water. And if we observe the SWAC spectra collected on the methanol mixtures, we have that uh, uh, a smaller increase in the scattered intensity, in particular in the small um, angle region, uh, occurs with respect to the water case. This suggests that probably no pseudo phase segregation uh, occurs in the methanol case. And this is confirmed by molecular dynamic simulations showing that even for high methanol contents, we have a totally homogeneous uh, uh, situation. This is interesting because from my point of view uh, of physical chemist, uh, uh, methanol is like a water molecule where a hydrogen atom has been substituted by a methyl group. Um, but this is sufficient to produce a totally different behavior of the DES uh, in contact with uh, the co-solvent. Uh, showing how much these uh, uh, transitions are depending upon the chemical nature of uh, the added solvent. Now, uh, the question is what happens so, uh, when we add methanol to this eutectic? Basically, methanol molecules are able to replace a high amount of uh, sesamol and choline molecules from the chloride anion coordination sphere. Then the other question ar arising is what is the destiny of such displaced sesamo and choline molecules? Here I'm reporting the coordination numbers computed for the sesamo sesamo choline sesamo and choline choline interactions, in particular hydrogen bonding, uh, in function of the methanol uh, molar ratio. And we observe that they remain as negligible as in the pristine uh, uh, DES. 
So these, so these interactions are not promoted by methanol addition. Differently, if we observe the coordination numbers for the uh, interactions of the methanol molecule with the sesamol and choline, they increase upon methanol addition. So the displaced sesamol and choline molecules get uh, solvated by the excess methanol molecules. A very different situation with respect to uh, water addition. Now, I want to show you the case of another eutectic, uh, in particular a metal-based eutectic solvent where one of the components is a metal salt. Uh, I have to confess that some time ago I tried to obtain some uh, new MDS by myself by mixing these uh, uh, chlorine metal salts in their anhydrous form with urea at this smaller ratio and as a result I couldn't obtain a liquid phase. Then I tried with the hydrated form of these metal salts and I could achieve these beautifully colored and highly viscous liquids. So my curiosity became what's the role of water in the achievement of uh, an eutectic phase and in the structural arrangement of these MDS. So I chose uh, the, the nickel one, added the water at precise molar ratios to form these samples and decided to study them. But prior to that, we have to uh, define the structure of the pristine MDS before the addition of uh, uh, extra water. And here again, I'm reporting a snapshot taken from the MD uh, simulation showing the local coordination around the nickel ion. We observe that nickel is coordinated by chloride anions and water molecules only. And the water molecules, while coordinating the metal ion, are also able to bridge between different nickel ion clusters. So the versatile role of water is able to keep together this sort of uh, oligomeric structure formed by nickel uh, ion clusters. And the experimental confirmation to this uh, theoretical uh, evidence uh, comes from the analysis of the EXAPS data collected on the pristine MDS that have been fitted by taking into account the average coordination obtained by molecular dynamics. So generating these single theoretical signals in blue for these paths of the photoelectron. And as we can observe, the agreement between the total theoretical contribution that is down here, still in blue, with the experimental data in red is excellent. So this average uh, local coordination around the nickel ion is confirmed. Upon the introduction of extra water, basically once water saturates uh, the nickel ion coordination sphere, it tends to fill the regions uh, among the nickel ion clusters, enlarging the nickel-nickel distance up to the loss of any nickel-nickel correlation. On a longer uh, range uh, point of view, uh, we observe that urea poorly coordinates the nickel ion so that uh, urea molecules are almost found as interspersed in the regions left vacant by the nickel ions. So the, the final supramolecular structure of this MDS is urea uh, acting as a sort of uh, inner solvent and lubricating the nickel rich regions. However, we couldn't achieve an experimental confirmation for this uh, segregation as it is not uh, captured by the SWAX data if you observe uh, the spectrum collected on the pristine MDS that is marked in red, we have a substantially flat small angle region. Uh, probably uh, these are transient species, uh, so um, the SWAX uh, um, technique is not able to capture uh, their uh, um, short lifetimes. Maybe also here, this can be a point of contact uh, uh, with Xfeld uh, since a uh, uh, pulsed uh, measurement could uh, uh, capture the short lifetimes of, uh, of these uh, structures. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the main uh, uh, we will observe a wax uh, pre-peak whose distance in the real space uh, is well compatible with the nickel-nickel correlation forming areas of higher electron densities interspersed by areas of lower electron density. In addition, upon the introduction of extra water, this wax pre-peak uh, broadens and shifts to longer distances in the real space. This is still consistent with the intercalation of more and more water molecules uh, among the nickel clusters, enlarging the nickel-nickel distance up to the achievement of uh, basically an equal solution of the MDS components with the loss of any nickel-nickel correlation. 
And the water behavior in these systems has been uh, further uh, confirmed by the water absorption in the near region. Since for the pristine uh, MDS, we observe a redshifted uh, shoulder that is compatible with the coordinating water molecules, while upon the introduction of extra water, this band blue shifts up to the absorption of a typical, uh, uh, typical bulk, uh, pure bulk water. Okay, so moving to the general conclusions, I will say that we demonstrated that uh, our combined approach between different uh, experimental, spectroscopic and uh, theoretical methods is sensitive towards the structural arrangement of uh, DES, and in particular their mixtures with co-solvents at different scale lengths. Um, more precisely, I let you notice that we observe an opposite behavior of the two presented DES upon uh, um, contact with the, the co-solvent. Since for the choline chloride sesamol DES, we uh, observe that uh, upon water introduction, uh, the promotion of a new nanostructure occurs. Differently, the pristine uh, nanostructure of uh, the nickel chloride MDS is basically disrupted upon uh, uh, water addition. Moving to the acknowledgements, I want to say thank to my uh, group in Rome at uh, Sapienza and uh, to all the other collaborators that also uh, contributed to this work. I want to thank uh, the SEALS uh, committee for uh, uh, giving me the possibility to participate to this interesting talk today. Uh, just a reminder that the next SEALS conference will be uh, hosted by uh, our uh, department uh, in uh, Rome. These are some of the facilities that allow the, the collection of the data that I showed you here today. And then I want to thank uh, all of you for your kind of attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matteo. And so now I would like to introduce the other speaker because I want to remind everybody that uh, these cafes are divided in two parts and uh, we give um, half an hour each to the speaker. Uh, and uh, just at the end, um, Matteo will ask some, something to Ruslan, and Ruslan to Matteo, and then all the others are involved in the discussion. So let me introduce uh, uh, Ruslan Kurta. Uh, he received his PhD in solid state physics uh, in two, uh, 2010 in Kiev. And after that, uh, he was at the Max Planck Institute for Metal Research in Stuttgart. And then uh, in DAC, in the group of X-ray crystallography and imaging in Hamburg. And now he is uh, presently staff scientist of the theory group of the European x -Fel. So, Ruslan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, you can see my slide now. Um, yes, yes. And thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me um, uh, to this uh, nice cafe. Um, I will speak about X-rays. Uh, I will speak uh, more precisely about correlated X-ray scattering approach uh, that is uh, that we developed in our lab uh, in order to facilitate uh, structure and dynamic studies of non-crystalline materials. And uh, although I will speak about x-rays of course but uh, since this virtual uh, cafe is hosted in uh, italy i thought it might be appropriate to start with uh, coffee uh, you know according to statistics about two billions of cups of coffee are consumed uh, every day and um, so coffee is uh, apparently a great uh, beverage i also like coffee but i also like x-rays and uh, x-rays are also great because they can provide us a lot of usable information and particularly about coffee as well so uh, here you see this nice x-ray microcomputer tomography image and you can see the interior of the coffee bean of a coffee bean and uh, it's because you can see it because uh, we know that x-rays can penetrate in the material and they, they can deliver uh, structural information uh, without damaging the object and uh, you know there is a, a, a bunch of processes uh, in coffee manufacture and one of the most important is coffee uh, roasting that's where the green coffee beans uh, turn to this dark um, uh, uh, dark brown uh, color and that they when they get uh, the uh, unique aroma and uh, flavor and uh, these micro city images from different types of coffee beans uh, grow, grown in different 
uh, areas of the world, they show uh, how the structure of the coffee bean changes during this uh, roasting process and it changes dramatically. It becomes more porous with uh, complex connectivity and it can affect the stability of the coffee bean. It can affect the grinding properties and also the, the brewing process. So it eventually can affect the coffee taste. So it's nice that we can get this information and understand this process better using x-rays. One can also uh, um, look at the uh, x-ray emission spectra and see uh, the spatial distribution of um, different uh, elements in the coffee beans. And eventually even there are ideas how to make uh, the coffee consumption uh, more responsible and use the coffee waste, which is uh, industrial coffee waste, which is quite huge uh, considering the consumption. So here this x-ray diffractogram again shows uh, traces of different uh, elements in coffee. So and what, what about the liquid coffee? It's a good example of uh, non-crystalline material, but uh, there are also many other non-crystalline materials that uh, surround us in our everyday life. And uh, examples are uh, one component liquids or uh, many component solutions like uh, Matteo was uh, showing in his presentation, colloids, forms, gels, aerosols, uh, amorphous and metallic uh, Glass, especially ordered solids, na nanoparticles and bioparticles. And, uh, you know, the common feature of all these materials is apparently that they don't uh, possess uh, translational symmetry in their structure opposite to crystals. But in turn, they can host a variety of other structural um, features like short and medium range order, bond orientation order, solutions may exhibit orientational anisotropy or structural heterogeneities like Matteo shown in his presentation. And the picture becomes even more complex when it gets to phase transition or, or chemical reactions. So such structural flexibility, of course, suggests that uh, there might be many different applications because structure is related to functionality and then uh, different functionality can be used to design different uh, devices. But on the other hand, it's much more difficult to characterize the structure of such materials uh, in contrast to crystals. Um, so, and um, in order to, 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 to show what the difficulties uh, we face, I would rather start, uh, switch to another example and leave the coffee, uh, detailed discussion of coffee structure to X-ray coffee gurus. But I would rather switch now to uh, biological solutions, um, which might be more scientifically uh, relevant. So uh, a well-known technique in uh, synchrotron community is called uh, biological small angle scattering, uh, which is used uh, in those cases where uh, crystals cannot be uh, obtained for some biological materials, and there are many such materials. In this case, one prepares a solution of uh, uh, bioparticles, which can be complex micromolecules, or viruses, for instance. And then uh, it's then X-ray beam interacts with such a um, uh, system of um, reproducible objects, molecules, and then scattered X-rays are detected on large area detectors. This technique is not very demanding in, sample, in, in terms of sample preparation and, and the sample can measure in a near native environment. That's why uh, it's um, uh, used so widely. If we look more precisely what is measured in such experiment, um, uh, we have this expression of intensity. We measure diffracted intensity as a function of momentum transfer. And um, in, in this case, it can be represented as a sum of two contributions. Um, one of them is simply a sum of contributions from individual molecules and the other, the other double sum is, um, is in interference terms. Since mostly in this type of experiments, uh, one uses dilute samples, so this text, second term can be neglected. And finally, one arrives to this uh, small angle X-ray scattering intensity expression, which is just related to the um, uh, squared um, orientationally averaged uh, squared form factor of single molecules. So this way we get access uh, to the structure of just individual uh, particles in, in this um, uh, solution. So typically, uh, since um, uh, in the interaction area where X-rays interact with particles, we normally have many reproducible particles in different orientations. We typically assume that the measured diffraction pattern is azimutally uniform. So if we consider this diffraction pattern in polar coordinate system as a function of the uh, momentum transfer magnitude and angle, 
one typically averages intensity azimutally to improve the statistics, and then one arrives to this one-dimensional intensity, small angle uh, X-ray scattered intensity profile. Uh, here it's uh, denoted with empty circles. And in order to extract, so we are interested, of course, in real space structure or electron distribution of the uh, in, inside the particle because uh, X-rays are sensitive to um, electron density distribution. So typically one can apply uh, something like bid modeling where one starts with uh, uh, some gas electron density distribution where one type of bids define um, uh, um, the, uh, the electron density, another just um, absence of density. And the initial gas can be quite far from, from reality. So then the simulated um, uh, SACS uh, profile from such pattern can be also uh, deviate quite far from the experimental result. But then moving these bits, one finally arrives to some structures that reproduces the experimental pattern uh, quite well. And then one believes that this is the uh, electron density that we seek. Um, the disadvantage of this technique, of course, is that uh, typically one can get only low resolution structural information about the, the uh, um, uh, particle structure, such as maximum size, uh, radius of generation, or uh, low resolution shape. And this is because uh, here we have relatively low uh, data, to param uh, data parameter ratio because we have only one dimensional profile that we can use. Um, so apparently people thought how to actually extend the information content of such measurements. And the problem that we have, uh, the problem of this low data parameter ratio is actually lies in the assumption, initial assumptions that our intensity is um, azimutally isotropic, uh, which we use here to integrate this intensity. So in order to go beyond this uh, approximation, we need to break uh, somehow this assumption. And the way it can be done can be explained uh, starting from a limiting case when we just consider only one that we scatter in the experiment only from a single individual particle. For example, from a um, uh, single virus like it's shown here. And the simulated diffraction pattern from such a virus that you can see here, it apparently shows that the scattering is uh, highly anisotropic. So if we plot the intensity distribution over this, uh, azimuthal intensity distribution over this ring uh, that is shown here as a function of azimuthal angle, uh, we can uh, define the intensity distribution over the angle while it's some mean value and fluctuation, azimuthal fluctuation. Uh, we will be interested in these fluctuations because, uh, as I said before, we are interested in observing some anisotropy in, in the scattered pattern. Apparently, this um, uh, this picture, this distribution of this fluctuation depends on the orientation of the virus particles. If we again assume that we perform scattering experiment on virus, on single virus, but uh, that takes different orientations, this picture will change. So the uh, uh, azimuthal distribution of fluctuations depends on the particle orientation. Coming uh, closer to the real system, in real experiment, we of course uh, typically in, in, in biological ZAX, one measures scattering simultaneously from many, many individual, many uh, reproducible particles in random orientations. So let's see what happens if we increase, uh, slowly increase the number of particles in the illuminated area. And that's what we have here. You see how the diffraction pattern changes and the azimuthal profile changes uh, for different number of illuminated particles. What we can see is that as the number of particles increases, the um, uh, the fluctuations become smaller and smaller. And eventually they become so small for some number of particles that you can barely distinguish that there are some fluctuations remaining. So if we um, plot carefully, investigate carefully this behavior, we will see that the ratio of, of the mean intensity of the actual fluctuation of the average fluctuation to the mean intensity value is inversely proportional to the square root of the number of particles. This means that for system with uh, for multiple particle system, these fluctuations are very small, and that's why in uh, in uh, conventional biological uh, ZACs uh, they are typically neglected. But uh, we can use them to extract additional information. How can we actually use these um, fluctuations to extract uh, some information? It was already some time ago proposed to use uh, this type of angular cross-correlation functions to analyze this um, information uh, that is stored in, in intensity fluctu fluctuations. So you, you can see it's defined as a 
uh, azimutally averaged uh, product of intensity is defined at some an, an angular separation. So if we plug now uh, the intensity, uh, uh, the formula for intensity that we introduced on the previous slide expressed through the mean and fluctuations that we can immediately see that this correlation function can be expressed through, through the correlation function of uh, expressed in terms of fluctuation when the, while this is uh, simply becomes a constant. So indeed, angular cross-correlation functions can be used to extract structural information from the measured intensity fluctuations. And hence, uh, here, uh, in, uh, uh, why, why is this uh, technique actually called correlated, correlated X-ray scattering or sometimes fluctuation X-ray scattering? Because of this reason, yes, that we explore uh, fluctuations. One important uh, point here to note that in real um, uh, solution, of course, particles move and rotate. And in order to be able to detect such fluctuation, it's important to have uh, 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 X-ray pulse uh, with duration that is shorter than rotational diffusion time of the particles. In this case, the diffraction patterns actually record instantaneous configuration of the sample. If the pulse duration is uh, relatively long, it corresponds to summing up all these instantaneous uh, snapshots. And then one again arrives to this uh, rather isotropic picture, and then uh, all information uh, that was present in fluctuations can be lost. So rotational diffusion smears uh, intensity fluctuations. And in order to be able to record these fluctuations to measure, we need short and intense pulses because uh, they should be intense enough to still record some reasonable signal um, during this uh, sample elimination. Likely, we have now such X-ray sources that can produce uh, very intense and short X-ray pulses, and these are X-ray free electron lasers. They are much more powerful than uh, even um, uh, uh, third generation um, synchrotron sources. Here on this uh, diagram, you can see that the uh, peak brilliance of uh, actual sources is about 10 orders magnitude higher than typical um, third generation synchrotron source. And the pulse duration is much, much shorter than a synchrotron source. It can be as short as, as only a few femtoseconds. And here you see the picture of the European XFEL that starts somewhere in Hamburg and then uh, there is a long, about three kilometer long tunnel and the labs we have actually uh, outside of Hamburg in another town, and I'm actually sitting in this building somewhere here while giving you this talk. So we can use X-ray free electron lasers to actually perform correlated X-ray scattering uh, measurements. And x wells are so powerful that we actually can measure diffraction pattern from just individual biomolecules. And as I've shown you, this is an um, easy example because in the case of single particles, the fluctuations are uh, very large, and it's uh, in our uh, first uh, proof of principle uh, experiment uh, with an X-ray, we actually uh, employed this experimental scheme where we just injected uh, just individual particles, in this case viruses, uh, using uh, uh, a, a special device which was producing this very focused uh, uh, particle stream and the X-ray beam was interacting with just individual particles. We work at Wixwell with in so-called uh, diffraction before destruction regime. Uh, each pulse basically destroys the particle, but uh, since X-ray propagate with speed of light because it's essentially it's light, so uh, we manage to record uh, the diffraction patterns from intact particles uh, while, of course, they exploit, explode um, after interaction with intense beam. In this experiment, we studied two types of viruses. One of them is uh, called rice dwarf, dwarf virus. Uh, which uh, infects actually rice uh, plants. Uh, it's about 70-75 nanometer in diameter. Another one is bacteriophage, uh, uh, about the same size. The structure of RDV virus, at least the structure of capsid, uh, was known, so it was rather a test particle for us, while the high resolution structure of this virus was not reported at that time. So we collected many diffraction patterns from just um, individual particles and then performed uh, X-ray cross-correlation analysis. Here we use a bit uh, extended set of cross-correlation functions where correlated intensities at, at different uh, resolutions and uh, combined uh, and, and, and computed uh, these correlation functions for all possible combinations of these momentum transfer values. 
Then instead of uh, analyzing directly these correlation functions, which is, uh, as you see, three-dimensional function, we uh, analyzed uh, instead the Fourier components of the correlation function by transforming the uh, correlation function over the angular coordinate. So now this is a two-dimensional function for each harmonic order and and uh, after uh, uh, we need also to perform orientational average uh, in order to get like uh, um, information about the entire 3D structure of the particle. So here you can see the result, what we get as a result for two different viruses. What you can see here is also the upper row is the uh, results for RDV and the um, uh, row in the bottom shows the results for another virus, PR772. What you can see here is the magnitude actually of the magnitudes of these uh, Fourier coefficients for harmonic order starting from 2 till 12, the most strongest contribution. And they are plotted uh, here with axis Q1, Q2, as it's uh, shown here. Yeah. So what one can immediately see is that we got quite complex fingerprint which reflects uh, the entire 3D structure because we performed orientational average of the uh, correlation uh, functions. We can immediately see that uh, since these maps are very di quite different, uh, so we can immediately say that the structure of the viruses must be also different. And just uh, to compare what we would get from conventional small angle scattering analysis is just these two one-dimensional curves for two viruses. And uh, it's obvious that the amount of information that we get from this correlation analysis is much, much higher. Uh, than from conventional Zach's analysis. Now the question, how we can analyze this information to get to the real space structure, to understand the structure of these viruses. One of the approaches is to apply model assisted structural analysis. So here again, I show the experimental result, actually the two lowest order Fourier components for two viruses. And I mentioned before that we had uh, a model of uh, atomistic model of um, RDV uh, virus, actually capsids of this alpha shell of the virus, uh, which was uh, reported from X-ray crystallography measurements. And when we performed simulation of the correlation maps, we were quite surprised to see that this result uh, deviates quite a lot from what we observed for, this, for, for, for the RDV virus that uh, we studied in our experiment. So in order to um, understand what the, all this means, we switched to bid modeling like in, in conventional ZACs. And since we knew that this structure of this virus is approximately icosahedral, we started with uh, solid icosahedral particle. And then by applying a small, a small uniaxial compression, we got the result that was uh, looking pretty much similar as the experimental result. And the same by applying slightly larger distortion, uh, we got the result for another virus that was uh, very much similar to the, looking similar to the experimental result. This shows that even such uh, simple uh, bead modeling analysis can al already kind of produce convincing results that saying that uh, our particles, uh, for some reason, were devi deviating actually from the predicted or determined from another uh, crystallography experiment, which was quite interesting result. Unfortunately, there are some limitations uh, of this type of modeling. For instance, here we have to use uniform density approximation and going beyond this approximation is difficult, while in, in, in real system, of course, you have um, uh, non-uniform, uh, um, in many cases, non-uniform density distribution. So in this case, we switch to so-called iterative phasing, uh, which is uh, well known in imaging community. Uh, in this case, one uses, in classical imaging approaches, one uses uh, scattered intensity distribution and then uh, phases, uses this intensity as constraint and, and determine uh, the structure, real space structure in, inter in iterative uh, manner without any model assumptions, essentially. And uh, my collaborators from Berkeley, uh, mathematicians, they developed an uh, extension of this classical phasing algorithm called multi-tiered iterative phasing, which uses uh, fluctuation uh, scattering data or uh, angular cross-correlation functions instead of intensities uh, and uses these data to iteratively determine the structure without any model assumptions. And you see here the results that we got for two viruses, for RDV and PR772. There are different views on this external shape and also some uh, electron density distribution inside the particles, which you see, you see that we got some non-uniformities. And generally, this is, uh, result is compatible with, with what we got from uh, model-assisted model analysis. So we see that the structure of PR772 virus 
deviates much more from ideal fosahedral than from RD wires. So this looks quite promising. And uh, this uh, proof of principle uh, experiment shown that indeed this correlation approach uh, works uh, once applied uh, at a X-ray free electron laser. Up to now, I consider that we had only one particle in the, and uh, we measured diffraction from individual particles uh, in each snapshot. Uh, but it would be interesting also, of course, to get uh, the results from multiple particle system. And this type of experiment was also uh, recently performed on a bit, a bit larger viruses of about 200 nanometer in size. But this time in the interaction region, there were like from 50 to 100 particles uh, present and the uh, uh, diffraction pattern from this multiple particle system were measured. The correlation analysis was performed and the structure was again determined ab initio from this type of data. So uh, this shows the feasibility of such experiment for structure determination, biological structure determination from uh, dilute solutions. Um, we are also interested in dynamics, of course, of uh, uh, solution. And um, another experiment that I want to present you here is time result optical pump probe um, um, pump uh, X-ray probe solution scattering experiment with an XL. Uh, in this case, uh, we studied uh, much smaller uh, metal organic complexes, iridium demand in this case. This metal complex contain, that uh, contains um, uh, two iridium atoms uh, surrounded by this uh, ligand uh, cloud. Uh, in this experiment, we wanted to see ultra-fast dynamics after, after optical excitation uh, of the electronic um, uh, system in this uh, type of molecule. So in the experiment, we had liquid jet where the sample was constantly a fresh sample injected uh, into the interaction region where it first interacted with optical pump or some selected um, wavelengths in order to trigger electronic transition in these molecules. And then the X-ray probe was following after some time delay, which was varied uh, in order to observe uh, scattering on large detector and follow this uh, ultra-fast dynamics in this system. What actually happens in this experiment is that uh, optical photon is absorbed with uh, solute molecules. And then uh, um, uh, there is promotion of electron from antibonding to bonding orbital located between these two iridium atoms. And uh, this triggers uh, then atomic uh, changes in the atomic structure of the uh, solid molecules. It also leads to alignment of the uh, fractional, uh, fractional alignment of the molecules due to the polarization of the optical pulse and, and the um, uh, uh, alignment of the transition dipole moments, um, optically excited transition dipole moments. This also leads to ultra-fast changes in the solvation shell due to changes in the uh, uh, solute uh, solvent interaction and also it also leads to some uh, ultra fast uh, bulk solvent uh, response uh, so in this experiment one typically measures the uh, uh, so-called pump off uh, diffraction patterns that's where the actually the system was not pumped but rather remains in, in equilibrium state then pump on images uh, were measured after excitation after a certain time delay which is noted here you see that there is a little difference this is because the difference is really small and if we subtract one from another we can then start to see that indeed we have some dynamics which is reflected in this uh, intensity fluctuations that start, we start to observe after optical excitation what we then done is uh, again applied this um, angular cross correlation analysis in this case uh, we have uh, time result uh, cross correlation function when we perform this uh, computation and each particular time delay and then again we performed free analysis of the cross correlation coefficients and uh, looked at these uh, coefficients uh, how they evolve in time here you can see the result for uh, iridium demand solution in acetonitrile, and you can see the strongest uh, first uh, two harmonics of so the zero order and second order. You can see that indeed we start to observe some changes after time zero. There is a small still remaining noise. And if we compare also um, uh, with correlation maps for pure solvent, we can also identify that uh, some uh, signal that appears at uh, at, at short times right now, it's uh, due to solvent, while the remaining signal is uh, 
due to solute and so solute solvent uh, interactions. So now we can also we apply it in this case model assisted analysis where we um, prepared atomistic models of the samples and here you see the comparison of the experimentally simulated results at, at uh, two picosecond time delay so it's really a uh, short time scale that we explore here and with our model we uh, managed to identify uh, for example the direction of the transition dipole moments which is quite uh, nice because typically such information is obtained from uh, spectroscopic measurements while here due to the fact that we have alignment of the excited particles we can also determine this um, uh, partially the um, changes in the electronic structure of the molecules but also we identified changes in the uh, internal structure of the excited molecules like ligand twist uh, iridium bond construction we also characterized the uh, structural disorder in the system after excitation so uh, indeed uh, by applying this approach it's also possible to study um, uh, the structure uh, and dynamics uh, of molecular solutions now coming a bit to more dense system before in previous example i was considering like rather uh, dilute uh, system where we we were interested in the mostly in the structure uh, of um, uh, dissolved uh, biological molecules or, or, or larger molecules um, uh, here is an example where the correlation analysis has been applied uh, to colloidal um, uh, glass and due to slow dyna uh, the dynamics in such system was um, uh, quite slow so it was possible to actually perform such measurements at a synchrotron some time ago and Peter Wachner and company they detected in in, uh, in the correlation functions this five-fold um, modulation and this was attributed to the local icosahedral packing of uh, these colloidal uh, balls you know it's quite interesting because we all know that this five-fold packing is com incompatible with uh, crystalline symmetry so this um, uh, triggered uh, substantial interest actually this work to the correlation um, uh, business another uh, example of, of very dense and atomic system uh, well it's not still not atomic but molecular system but uh, quite dense it's uh, liquid crystals so we applied correlation analysis to study development or uh, to actually study the phase transition from smectic to hexatic phase Hexatic phase, it's a, um, it's a quite interesting phase where there is uh, there is only short range positional order, um, and but but there is a, a quasi long range bond orientation order where this typical bond angles uh, six fold symmetry is preserved over very uh, long range, and in this case we were uh, following the correlation functions or, or Fourier coefficients of the correlation correlation functions while uh, actually uh, observing the phase transition from smectic uh, to hexatic phase which produces this nice six-fold modulation due to appearance of bond orientation order and we determined um, uh, and this uh, Fourier coefficients of correlation functions that can be, can be linked to the so-called bond orientation order parameters that are uh, qualitative measures of how these bond orientation order develops and uh, then uh, one can link this to the theories that describe the uh, 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 actually the, the development of the structure uh, uh, during this phase transition so it was uh, quite nice to see that correlation analysis can also uh, provide some useful insights and finally I would like to mention um, um, uh, something about the um, amorphous materials dense amorphous materials um, uh, like metallic glasses uh, in this case, uh, a typical um, way to analyze uh, scattering intensity is to determine the structure factor, which is normalized uh, in a certain way um, um, uh, scattering intensity. And then by performing Fourier transform, one typically get a radial distribution function or pair distribution function. And this provides uh, only limited information. Um, uh, um, so it's, it provides... Uh, uh, it basically gives the number of atoms uh, that surround a reference atom at particular distance. Uh, on the other hand, recently it, it has been proposed to use the correlation function instead of uh, and 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 um, instead of uh, going to radial distribution function, one can then transform the uh, angular correlation function to get something called pair angular distribution function, which is nice because it contains not only information about the bond lengths but also about on bond angles. 
this is really something new that just appears appeared recently but uh, looks very promising uh, um, like very promising approach for uh, that can be used to study um, uh, dense amorphous systems so to summarize uh, i presented you the correlation um, correlated x-ray scattering or fluctuation x-ray scattering approach uh, that relies on the ability to measure angular intensity correlations in the scattered uh, intensity fluctuations can be used to study vari various uh, non-crystalline materials like uh, aerosols, uh, uh, solutions, colloid, liquid crystals, and other amorphous or partially ordered materials. And it's especially suitable for XLs uh, since they produce ultra fast uh, and uh, ultra short and ultra bright, bright X ray pulses. So, if you have some nice ideas, uh, please uh, come to XL and do your research with us. And at the end, of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, all my collaborators that contributed to the projects that uh, I highlighted on my slides. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this extremely interesting talk. And uh, so now, Matteo and uh, Ruslan, uh, do you have each other some questions uh, concerning what we um, just listened? Uh, for example, Matteo was showing some, uh, let's say, more standard, small angle, uh, wide angle scattering, and Ruslan uh, um, pushed further much in this field. So, Matteo. Yeah, I've got a, a list of questions, actually. <laughs> okay, the, the first is an, an naive one. Uh, since you showed us that uh, your uh, X-ray pulses, for viruses at least, they destroy the structure. Uh, do they also destroy, uh, let's say, molecular systems? Because for the uh, pump probe experiment, uh, you showed us that uh, the setup in the setup, you needed a fresh sample always, right? So what about uh, the, um, let's say, uh, radiation damage on, on your samples? Yes, it's a good question. And the question of radiation damage is uh, very important to XOS. I would say that for soft matter systems or biological systems or in principle, if we don't speak about something like metallic glass that is heavily scattering and where you, we can, in principle, attenuate a beam, and there is also, um, uh, uh, let's say, the distribution of uh, the energy redistributes much faster, um, for instance, in metals than in, in, in biological systems. So we always need to refresh the sample. There is no way. The, uh, to to that sample survives. The beam is so intense that basically it literally explodes. Everything explodes. Yeah. So in uh, in scattering experiments on such systems like uh, solutions or liquids, we always use uh, specially designed sample delivery systems like uh, injectors. There are many designs, and uh, we always use to have a fresh sample. This, of course creates some challenges for systems uh, which are expensive because you always have to you need to have certain amount of samples that you lose mm -hmm. unavoidably you know so this yes. is one of the disadvantages but on the other hand as i mentioned so the x-ray pulses are so so uh, can be so short that uh, the signal that we record if it's especially um, let's say not extremely high resolution uh, imaging but small resolution where you anyway limit your resolution so you won't see uh, the effect of radiation damage in principle so the x-rays okay. are so fast we are going now towards towards sub femtosecond pulses so this is way beyond any, even any more many electronic processes so you can in principle in situ observe some electronic transitions yeah so and of course the damage starts when you have already many electronic processes going on and they damage the structure yeah that's how it starts so in, 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 in this sense we are safe and we always say that we work in this diffraction before destruction mode yeah the experimental setup is a, a, a real concern I mean, um, sorry for for being so technical uh, with, with the audience but uh, uh, you have to deal with that if you want to perform an experiment and uh, 
trying to figure out uh, an experiment at your beam length with uh, my uh, kind of samples. Uh, we have a, a DES, pristine, perfectly dry, and uh, we want uh, to uh, study water addition with your X-ray pulses to get a dynamic picture. Uh, but we need an injection, an injection system, probably adding uh, precise quantities of uh, water uh, each, I don't know, time. Uh, but the, the pristine sample has to be in a, a flow injection too, right? So uh, for this purpose, ends. yeah, for this purpose, yeah. of course, um, um, in our company, we have a, a the entire department that works actually on sample delivery system systems and one of the systems that might be relevant to your case where you want to actually mix or add something and look how it evolves yeah so uh, there is a special type of device called mix and inject devices so basically it assumes that there are two components which you mix and then uh, you expect that after some time uh, you start to see the dynamics and then you study as far as I know, current, uh, currently the devices that were designed in, in our company, they enable measurements. Uh, so you have you, you, your sample have to be mixed and delivered to the point where it interacts. Okay. And the, as far as I remember, the smallest uh, time after mixing that is accessible is on the order of one millisecond. So it means that the shortest time after mixing that you can approach is one millisecond actually at the moment. So it means that everything that happens on the faster time scales, you won't see because the sample has not yeah. yet arrived. But I must say that people always develop something new and I'm pretty sure that uh, if you want to access something like nanoseconds, that is probably more relevant according to your uh, molecular dynamics, at least simulation. Yeah, so you need some kind of equilibration, uh, but it also depends, of course, uh, you mentioned that the uh, diffusion constants may be pretty off. So this uh, typically this estimation somehow of this initial um, accessible time point that is relevant for you is, is quite important somehow to before you come to do real experiments. Yeah. Otherwise, if you want to observe something on the faster time scale, you might not be able. Um, there is a difference if you if you can actually if you don't mix the samples but you want to trigger the dynamics for instance with optical pulse then it can be arbitrary fast as i shown you you can approach the time scales of femtoseconds or picoseconds but yeah. then you need a well-defined trigger while when you mix uh mix something it cannot be done exactly in the interaction regions it's the system involves you know some tubes and, and lines so yeah. but uh yeah. But people think it's not the only case I hear about these mix, uh, mixing experiments where you really want to mix two components and just see what's happening. Uh, there, are, if 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 the if this um, um, the process uh, that you are interested in is very fast, sometimes people uh, try to slow down these uh, dynamics also somehow to maybe modify to prepare some model system where these dynamics can be potentially slower or you can tune it somehow so that to see some yeah. differences you know yeah yeah okay i have to confess you that even if i showed um an estimation of uh, the time scale of uh, that pseudo phase segregation uh, i have no idea of that because um, molecular dynamics uh, as i told you before is very bad in determining dynamic properties if uh, uh, polarization is not taken into, into account at least and in particular, it tends to uh, underestimate the cell diffusion coefficients of one or two orders of magnitude, meaning that uh, in my equilibration, uh, the segregation seems to occur in the nanoseconds time scale. But probably this is uh, it is uh, it, uh, it's um, underrated, so it is faster probably you know, or the, a few nanoseconds or even in the femtoseconds time scale. So your uh, I think that your technique will be uh, suited for uh, that, those samples, but uh, maybe the the setup uh, should be um, studied a, a little bit. But what's your your feeling about that? Uh, if you, you saw my my samples, right? So is it possible to obtain a, a dynamic picture? Your opinion. Um, so um, 
so here it's a question is only about uh, the rather the setup because uh, in theory if we can reach approach those time scales in principle mm -hmm. we can try to apply this correlation analysis especially this okay i think those probably new methods that uh, i shown just on the last slide where you can invert the measured data and get some uh, pair angle distribution function might be even more relevant for this case uh, it's it's a question about rather technical feasibility, which of course should be discussed with also with involvement of of uh, uh, other groups that are more focused on this development. Because I'm not maybe not aware of the latest development, and it's uh, generally uh, before actually suggesting some experiment, we it's it's kind of uh, good to contact some people and you know ask these uh, technical feasibility questions and discuss. Uh, our people are always open for that. But also, generally speaking, um, about co applying correlation analysis, of course, we, uh, we our dream initial goal was actually to apply it directly to liquids when we started all this business. But that appeared uh, very difficult because you remember at the beginning, I shown you that in biological solutions, we normally uh, assume dilute uh, sample where we're interested in one component where the distance between molecules are is very large compared to their size and this simplifies uh, the analysis considerably while here we are uh, in your case I, as i understood we are dealing um, with a kind of dense system which is quite heterogeneous i could imagine that correlation analysis if we able to kind of uh, assemble proper setups and access those times um, i would assume that we could still um, uh, may extract some some additional information that I would dream about that that let's let's say it was our one of our original dreams and we are now slowly coming to, to you know to this uh, uh, topic again so I would uh, say I would rather be positive it sounds interesting although it's a bit unusual system for me because you have like uh, rather huge heterogeneities that form with time but if we can access those times i think probably correlation functions can provide some additional uh, information when analyzing this uh, zax region especially where you see this uh, uh, low q region where you see this formation of rise of the peak due to formation of aggregates i would say at least it it it, it sounds interesting for me <laughs> okay maybe it could also be a chance to try uh, and to improve a new setup for you i don't know just a sure sure we are always as i said we always uh, looking we are always open and looking for some you know new applications to new materials um, so this uh, generally looks interesting and just a practical question uh, maybe i think we have uh, questions from the audience right Cinzia, so uh, yeah, we just I wanted to ask, ask then uh, if somebody else w uh, wants to ask somebody, I mean, something to Matteo or to Ruslan also from the audience. Okay, but you you can uh, keep uh, some. Yeah, the last to... question is very simple, uh, Ruslan. Uh, are you suffering uh, power shortcuts at XFEL, like in some European synchrotrons? Do you have reduced the beam time for users in the next uh, sessions? Um, no, I don't think that we we have planned uh, power shortcuts sometimes we have of course planned period of maintenance uh, but uh, okay. uh, we kind of now in so-called harvesting period where we try when we try to maximize the uh, amount of beam times that we give to users so next few years i would assume that we we would really have a lot of uh, possibilities for users more probably than in the previous year so it's good time to apply to come yes okay from my side I, if i'm allowed i would generally express i'm also impressed uh, quite impressed by your work and uh, uh, i like this also this combined approach this is i think the the way where we um, have to move in many studies we have to kind of uh, do this kind of established correlations between different techniques mm -hmm. to yeah. make the data analysis more reliable and and uh, and uh, uh, the data more interpretable so my question is, uh, uh, so as I understood, you also like uh, uh, the interpretation is heavily depends on, uh, on, on modeling essentially, because you always also use molecular dynamics to kind of interpret. Although uh, at the same time, of course, from, me from Zach's pattern, uh, measurements of solely Zach's patterns, just looking at the 
changes in Zach's patterns, you can already say something even without referring to uh, uh, to the models, like uh, looking at certain regions, right? So how are you, how much are you dependent on this modeling and how uh, actually, how do you think it's, uh, uh, how good are your models actually? Because the system, as for me, it looks already quite complex. It's like multi-component mm -hmm. system uh, with, with uh, complex dynamics depending on contact. So uh, this 100 nanometer box, is it sufficient? Because uh, I think the pore that you see is like almost the size of the box, like 70 versus yeah. 100 nanometers. So maybe you can comment a bit on, on this. Yeah, yeah, of course, the, the let's say the simulation, uh, you run the simulation at the, the level of theory that you need to interpret the, the scientific case. So in, uh, in that case, uh, since we had the, uh, um, segregation in the sub nanometer scale uh, that dimension was, was sufficient but it really depends on what you want to, to see uh, for example in, in first instance i was simulating a, a smaller uh, uh, a smaller box 50 Armstrong, that is a very classical one uh, then talking with uh, the guys that performed the, the sax analysis we understood that the the, the pseudo phase separation provoke the bigger structure, so I had to enlarge the system. So in each case, it, it is adjusted to the, the scientific question. And uh, this also applies for the, the level of theory of the so-called force field. Uh, even if you said that uh, the system is very uh, complicated with a lot of uh, phases and species, uh, for S and uh, P block elements, uh, classical molecular dynamics still uh, performs very well, uh, apart from the dynamic uh, uh, properties that you probably uh, require. Um, your, you need uh, polarizability, uh, but you're still in a classical uh, regime with no quantum mechanics. Uh, everything starts being a bit different when you have uh, uh, metal ions, because of course to approximate um, metal ion with a, a classic potential is a rude approximation uh, but i show you the nickel based uh, metal based uh, deprotective solvent in that case uh, the level of theory was adjusted to the uh, exact data even if uh, i told you it was the opposite <laughs> so it was a, a, a little bit a, a trick it's like uh, um, a synergic process because you uh, adjust the level of theory on the experimental data, in this case, EXAS is of course very sensitive to the, the local coordination, so it's the uh, technique of choice to have a, a reference. And then uh, once you uh, had settled your level of theory, you can use the simulation to get even other information. This is how we work, more, more or less. I hope I answered your, your question. Okay, can um, uh, can we ask the audience uh, if uh, somebody has uh, some uh, left questions? Just uh, a comment from me uh, to Russell. Ah, oh, Rocco, bye. Okay. Rocco. I will have a question for Matteo. Um, I noticed that uh, when you compare molecular dynamics with your uh, sax wax uh, profile, you do it uh, not directly. So not mm -hmm. you don't do a fit, but uh, you just uh, calculate the size of the of the particle and then check on the molecular dynamics. Would would it be possible to do it uh, directly? So just uh, the, uh, calculating this profile from the molecular average molecular dynamic system and then fit with the data with some free parameter. Yeah, it is possible and uh, it's something that I often uh, read in the, in the literature. Uh, people are doing that. Uh, we uh, try to do that, but we had problem with the small angle region. The wax uh, profile are captured very well, but for uh, uh, bigger inhomogeneities, you need uh, very large simulation boxes. Uh, and so a difficultly affordable uh, simulation. Uh, something I want to try is also like a, a Monte Carlo process where each uh, uh, configuration is uh, kept only if it uh, fits properly the, 
the Swax profile. Uh, many things can be done. Uh, I know that, yeah, I just compare the MD results separately with the, uh, the experimental SACS profiles, but uh, this is something we are trying, uh, we are trying to do. I, I wish to do better in the future to compute the SACS better from the, the MD simulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if uh, there is no other question, or oh, meanwhile, I would like to ask uh, Ruslan, uh, can you give us, uh, especially to the younger people in the audience or everybody, I mean, uh, who is new for to XFED, um, so if we have a good idea like Matteo has, uh, what should we do? Should we write uh, before the proposal, I mean, because the, the proposal is very demanding, so before that, did you, you allow to do some tests for uh, somebody who has never tried anything at XFEL? Uh, how does it work? Okay, so um, there are different uh, things that might be here relevant. So first of all, we have a website where the information about all beam lines and instruments and via parameters and capabilities are shown. So you can already if you have something specific in mind, you can already check uh, which uh, beamline might be more suitable, which instrument might be more suitable for you. And then uh, there is normally contact email of the contact person for that instrument, and you can directly ask him relevant technical question to you know to estimate technical feasibility. Uh, uh, there are also um, uh, so we have proposal calls several times per year, and uh, uh, on the web, I think on the website we also have announcement of the so-called uh, so-called town hall meetings, which happened before the proposal deadline. And there, uh, um, so actually uh, different uh, um, uh, group leaders and, and heads of the instruments that give an update uh, or on the current situation on the instrument, where you can also uh, get up-to-date information about instrument and capabilities, and. Uh, I mean, uh, this way by communicating with uh, with um, uh, beamline responsible, you can already uh, kind of establish contact and uh, and um, actually ask the relevant questions. Also, often people do if they have have access to lab sources or synchrotron sources. It also depends on the experiments. They can do test experiments uh, there to you know to check various things uh, maybe not everything what you want but at least uh, check if sample is injecting for example properly because uh, injectors they perform very differently you may think you modify viscosity of your solution a bit but then it somehow clogs and doesn't inject so all these kind of tests uh, can be performed and uh, very desired that you perform some tests some tests can be also performed before the experiment in the lab. If you arrive well in advance, you can also start testing in the lab, for, for example, injection and so forth. And other type of characterization, we, are, we have very uh, extensive uh, laboratory equipment, uh, uh, all kinds of microscopes and other types of diagnostics. Otherwise, we, hold, we also have uh, users meetings that happens every year and it might be quite useful to come there and um, talk to people. Uh, so these are kind of uh, major pathways. Yeah, and um, uh, sometimes it might be uh, useful. So at the beginning, we also had uh, so-called collaborative proposals where many people who don't who also don't have much experience could join could have uh, joined the more experienced groups in the experiments to see how it all works um, so there are different ways if you know already some group uh, uh, who does experiments you may try to join that group uh, so there are different ways you know how to how to do it and one can of course combine and explore different poss possibilities okay thanks a lot Okay, so if there are no other questions, uh, let me thank again the speakers. And uh, of course, uh, we are waiting for uh, ideas from you and also for application for the coming uh, SEALS Congress. And why not also to come uh, to our society as a um, 
newcomers. So thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. Bye. -bye. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.